In this video, I want to lay a foundation for a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And this foundation is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit will build everything on this foundation. Before you learn how to have a, a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you first have to have a, a true relationship with Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. A distant, lukewarm, religious acquaintance with Jesus isn't enough. But when Jesus becomes your entire foundation, the result will lead to a deep relationship with the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing. He wants a relationship with you. Have you ever wondered why? Is it because of your prayer life? Is it because of your fasting? Is it because of your sacrifices? Or because you evangelize or do full-time ministry? Not at all. The Holy Spirit's relationship with you is based on Jesus. That's it. It has nothing to do with your piety, with your hunger, with your humility, or even your holiness. Jesus is the foundation for the Spirit's relationship with you. Before we were saved, the Holy Spirit was with us, wanting to reveal Jesus to us. But the Holy Spirit begins his work in us after, only after we accept Jesus. He comes to live inside of us to develop godly character. He makes us more like Jesus and teaches us how to live righteous, and it all begins with Jesus. In Jesus' time, during the Feast of Tabernacles, a, a priest would take a golden vessel to the Pool of Siloam early every morning and fill it with water from the spring. He would then bring it back to the altar and the people would shout with sounds of praise. The crowd would recite a special prayer from the book of Psalms as the pure water was poured out on the west side of the altar. And this ritual was a commemoration of the water that God supplied from the rock for the children of Israel during their time in the wilderness. Now check this out. This ritual would be done for seven days, but not on the eighth day, which was the final day of the feast. And it was on the last day of the feast that Jesus cried out in John 7, 38 and 37 and 38. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. On that day, when no water was brought from the pool of Siloam, Jesus himself declared rivers of living water to all the people. And today, Jesus promises us, us rivers of living water, not a new religion. All the Jewish feasts, all the ceremonies, and the Sabbaths that were established in the Old Testament were just a shadow of the things to come. But Jesus is the actual meaning of them all, according to Colossians 2. Jesus is the reality behind the ritual of the Feast of Tabernacles. He is the rock that Israel drank from, which Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Think back to when Moses struck the rock with his rod and water flowed out in Exodus 17. The same thing happened when Jesus was crucified. Water and blood pour out of his side when a soldier pierced him with a spear. And this became the significant picture of cleansing by the blood of Jesus and by the water of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle John said that the Holy Spirit hadn't been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now, glorified in this context speaks of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. The Father waited for Jesus to finish his work of atonement on the cross before sending his Spirit on the believers. The manifestations of the Spirit came only after Christ was glorified and, the, and, and seated at the Father's right hand in heaven. Pentecost followed the cross. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is the basic foundation for a Spirit-filled life. Anyone that wants to walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit has to build on the foundation of Jesus' glorification. Friends, the Spirit manifests Himself whenever Jesus is glorified. If you want to experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit, glorify Christ. What Jesus did on Calvary has to be the single greatest thing in your mind because if you value the cross, Pentecost will follow. If you want to have a spirit-filled life, build your life on the foundation of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection because fire falls on the altar. The fire of the Holy Spirit falls on the sacrifice of Jesus. You and I are just an altar, but Jesus is the sacrifice that attracts the fire of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 7, Christ compared a spirit-filled life to rivers of living water. Now, rivers is plural. It's not singular. And in John chapter 4, while talking to a Samaritan woman, Jesus compared salvation to living water. Now, there is a big difference between living water and rivers of living water. At salvation, we receive living water. But when we are walking in the Holy Spirit, we have access to rivers of living water. 
The Holy Spirit is water from heaven. John 7, 38 says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And I wonder how many times we as believers replace the rivers of the Holy Spirit for shallow, comfortable, kiddie pool versions of the flesh. Guys, one of the marks of the last days, according to Apostle Paul, will be believers having a form of godliness, but denying its very power, according to 2 Timothy 3, 5. We have to guard our hearts so that we won't settle for religious form without substance. I mean, that's what a hot tub is. It's man-made, it's man-controlled, and it sure is relaxing and warm and comfortable. And oftentimes that's exactly what happens with our religion. We create spiritual hot tubs, but Jesus is offering rivers of living water. The water he gives us quenches our thirst. Did you know most doctors advise that you actually shouldn't sit in a hot tub longer than 20, 25 minutes because it can actually dehydrate you. But the rivers that Jesus offers not only hydrate you, but flow out of you to quench the thirst of others around you as well because rivers promote life. A hot tub requires electricity. Rivers generate electricity. One depends on outside power, the other provides the power. And without the river of God flowing through us, we are reduced to mo monuments instead of movements. When Lot's wife looked back at the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, she became a pillar of salt. Guys, you and I are called to be people of salt on the earth, not pillars of salt. Pillars don't move. Pillars are stationary. They're stuck in one place. Believers are meant to move. When believers are filled with the Holy Spirit, they become a movement. It's time to get activated spiritually. Examine your life. Have you been stuck in a religious system, not moving forward, just tired of the same old things for decades, living with the same demons, the same addictions, the same sins? Could it be that you've substituted the life-giving rivers for something else? The words of Jesus on the last day of the feast are fitting and true for you and I today. He said in John 7, 37, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Come to the living water and have a drink. That drink will become like a river and it will keep you hydrated spiritually because it will never run dry. There is enough flowing water to keep you on course as you walk with God for the rest of your life. There is enough power in that river to help you conquer your flesh, conquer your demons and the world. There is so much power in that river that it will flow out of you and it will nourish those around you. Prophet Ezekiel saw a vision of this living water flowing out of the temple in Ezekiel 47. The water speaks of the Holy Spirit flowing out of the believer who is his temple. Guys, God made us his temple, not a tomb. Tomb are resting, tombs are resting places for the dead. Now there are decorative stones, right? There are pretty flowers that you can put and many good memories that you can write on a tombstone, but there's no life. Jesus called religious people tombs places where life used to be, right? They decorated their religious life with self-discipline and piety and good works, but they were straight up dead on the inside. Understand, sin turns our hearts into tombs of death and decay, but by the grace of God, Jesus takes that tomb and transforms it into a temple. Praise the Lord. We go from a grave to the garden. We go from hiding in sin to hosting the spirit, from living in secret sin to being a secret place for him. The Holy Spirit is holy. His very name is holy. Did you know that spirit is actually not the name? Spirit is an identity. His name is literally holy. And so the Holy Spirit can visit anyone, but he can live only in a holy place. Why? Because his name is holy. It's who he is. The Holy Spirit does not inhabit unclean places. Jesus' finished work on the cross created a makeover by turning the hearts that looked like a garbage dump into a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. And so, and so many people say, and, and I get why they say it because it sounds really nice, but it's actually not totally accurate. So many people claim that because of grace, the cross set the bar lower. It set the bar higher. At salvation, God gave us a new nature, a new spirit, and a new identity so that we can become prime real estate where the Holy Spirit himself would live. Jesus' death on the cross not only gave an eternal place in heaven for us, but also made us a habitation for the Holy Spirit to dwell in here on this earth. Temples don't build themselves. Somebody else has to build them. We were transformed into a temple by the work that Jesus accomplished on the cross because even our best works can't turn us into a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. 
We don't become a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit by our religious piety. It's not about our works or our efforts, but by the by Jesus's death on the cross. All four gospels record an account of the Holy Spirit descending like a dove on Jesus at his baptism. Now, why is that important? It's important because doves represent purity and innocence and, and gentleness. A dove is a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit. Leonard Ravenhill famously pointed out that there are nine feathers on each of the wings of the dove. And hello, there are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit and nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. I mean, check out the symbolism here. This is awesome. And every single dove has five tail feathers representing the fivefold ministry gift, gifts of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The tail feathers of a dove are like the rudder of a ship. They help in the balance and direction in flight, just like the fivefold ministry gifts in the church bring balance to the body of Christ. Come on. This is a beautiful portrait of the Holy Spirit and how he operates. When Jesus was baptized in the river, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove on Jesus, who John the Baptist declared to be the Lamb of God. That day, the dove descended on the Lamb, which means without the Lamb, there would be no dove. Without the sacrifice, there would be no fire. Without the cross, there would be no Pentecost. Without Jesus being glorified, there would be no release of the Holy Spirit. The first time a dove is mentioned in the Bible was after the flood, when Noah released one from the ark. This dove left the ark on three separate times. The first time, the dove flew back to the ark because there was actually no place for it to rest. And this speaks to the Old Testament times when the Holy Spirit would, would, would only come upon certain people who were given a specific, a special assignment, but he didn't reside inside of them. The second time the dove left the ark, it returned with an olive leaf. And this speaks to the gospel being declared by Jesus under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And the third time the dove left the ark, it did not come back. This speaks of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church as prophesied by the prophet, prophet Joel, which was fulfilled on the day of the Pentecost. The ark saved Noah from the flood of God's judgment on the land and all of the evil people on the earth. The ark was made of wood, just like the cross was. The ark had one door, which is parallel of, of Jesus being the one and only door to salvation. There was only one window in the ark, which represents the word of God. Inside of the ark was only one family, which represents the church. The dove lived inside the ark just as the Holy Spirit lives in those who trust Jesus for their salvation. Jesus' finished work on the cross is the ark that protects us from the judgment of God. Just as the dove lived in the ark, the Holy Spirit lives in those who are made righteous by faith. Just like the dove who entered through the ark, through the window, it, the same is true with the Holy Spirit whenever we open up God's word. It's the window through which we view life and the window through which the light of God's revelation comes to us. God's spirit, who is the author of God's word, will flow freely into us and through our lives. Guys, I can't emphasize this enough. The Holy Spirit lives inside of our temple. And in order to experience the release of the Holy Spirit, we have to cultivate a relationship with Jesus daily. It's the most important relationship in your entire life on this side of eternity. The writer of Hebrews writes that the doctrine of baptisms is one of the fundamental doctrines of the Christian belief, according to Hebrews 6. And many of you have probably heard of at least two baptisms, water baptism and the baptism in the, in the Holy Spirit. But the New Testament actually speaks of more than two baptisms. It actually mentions seven, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire, the baptism of suffering, the baptism into the cloud, the baptism into Moses, the baptism of John and water baptism. Now that's a lot of baptisms, y'all. The Greek word for baptism is baptizo, which means immersion. It signifies, it signifies being fully submerged. It's not a sprinkling or just a pouring of water on a person. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, the Bible says that he came up from the water, Matthew 3, 16. So therefore he was fully submerged into that water. Now let me explain the difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is being fully immersed into the body of Christ, which is his church. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is about being fully immersed into the Spirit. Remember how you were, when you were baptized, you went, you went completely into the water? That was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He immerses you fully into the Lord Jesus Christ and his church, which happens at the moment of salvation. 
But after that, Jesus baptizes you into the Holy Spirit, meaning he immerses you fully into his spirit. The baptism of or by the Holy Spirit is done by the Holy Spirit. The baptism in or into the Holy Spirit is done by Jesus. John the Baptist declared that Jesus would baptize people with fire and with the Spirit. When you get saved, you experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, it's Jesus who does that. On the day of Pentecost, it was Jesus who was baptizing believers into the Spirit. The Spirit baptizes you, making you a member of His body. But Jesus baptizes you into His Spirit to equip you for work in His kingdom. Come on! The baptism of the Holy Spirit makes you a member of the church or the body of Jesus. The baptism in the Holy Spirit immerses you into the realm of His power and spiritual authority. The Holy Spirit implants us into the person of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one Spirit. That's why at salvation, Scripture declares that we are in Christ. In Christ we are a new creation. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And friends, do you know how we got to be in Christ? It was the work of the Holy Spirit. We were baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit. God looks at us and sees Jesus because we are in him. The baptism of the Holy Spirit comes before the baptism in the Spirit. Every Christian was baptized by the Holy Spirit at the time of their salvation. At that very moment, the Holy Spirit does the miracle of implanting us into Jesus. In fact, we can't even be a part of the body of Jesus and his church without the baptizing work of the Holy Spirit. And so the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not about tons. It's not about power, but about being immersed into Jesus, into his body, which is his church. And then following that initial baptism, Jesus immerses us into the Holy Spirit, who then enables us to serve God with power. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is done by Jesus. Does that make sense? Is this helping anybody? Please let me know in the comments down below. This is very helpful for me. In the next video, we're going to get into one of the most misunderstood topics for many Christians, which is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to want to miss it. Um, I, I'm doing an entire Holy Spirit series. It's going to go across a, a bunch of different videos. So if you like this, if this was helpful, if you want to see more content like this, please subscribe to the video, click the notification button, like this video, share it with your friends and, and with your family, spread the word, and let's grow in the revelation and the power of the Holy Spirit together.